Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How's everybody doing? My name is Brian Marvell, apparently. It's good to see you all. A uh, special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So years ago, when I first started in ministry, I had a, a guys group that I was a part of, and we met every Friday morning at a Panera in our community. And the purpose of this group was simply to study the scriptures together, encourage one another, walk through life together, and pray for one another. And every time we would meet, the first thing we would do is just ask one question, and that was, how was your week? We'd just spend some time processing how the week was for each other, what were the highs, the lows, what were the victories that we wanted to celebrate with each other, what were the challenges that we faced. And on this particular morning, uh, my friend Brian, another guy named Brian, who's at the group, came in, we were sitting in a booth, and he just sat across from me, and he's like, man, this week was really hard, and it's really challenging and unexpected, and so we asked, well, what, what happened? And Brian and his wife, Sarah, had two Boston Terriers. Her family loved Boston Terriers. There's family members who actually showed Boston Terriers, like put them in competitions, and so they were just like a family full of Terriers, and so they had two of them. They had like two rejects, meaning like these animals weren't good enough to be shown in competition. So Brian and Sarah got them, and they just loved these animals like they were their own kids. Now, their oldest one, Emma, had, some, had a medical condition that needed um, medicine and medication every day. And one on this week in particular, they, she had some complications, both with her condition and the medication, and they had to take her to an emergency vet appointment. And so they went to this appointment, they ran some tests, and basically, I don't know the details of the condition or what was wrong, but the vet said, she needs an emergency surgery, like, right away, or she's not going to make it. So they, they do the procedure, and then he's just processing, like, the stress of that, the concern of that. Uh, anytime you invite an animal into your life, like you get a pet, you know that you're just inviting heartbreak into your life, because you know that you're probably going to outlive this pet, and you just get so attached to this pet. So he was thinking, like, is she going to make it? And so there's just all this stress and concern, and then there was all the extra work they had to do to care for her after surgery. And then he started talking about, like, the financial cost of it all, and just what it ended up, like, the burden of that. And as we're processing all of that, I kept bringing up the finances of it, and I was clueless. I was like, well, how, like, how much did you pay? Like, $500? a thousand dollars and he looked up at me and he goes I'm like what two thousand dollars three thousand dollars and he goes and instead of just like me continuing to spit out numbers he said yeah, the, the surgery cost ten thousand dollars and my friend adam was sitting next to him sipping his coffee as he said ten thousand dollars and he had to like choke to keep it in so he didn't spit it all over the table my jaw dropped, my eyes went out. I was like, $10,000. I mean, like, I know that we love our pets, but this is what I said. I'd be the first one out back with a shovel digging a ditch for $10,000. He, he didn't think it was that funny of a comment. <laughs> but I just naturally just started to cycle through in my head, like, what would I do with $10,000? I could go buy a new car for $10,000, or at least a good used car. I could get this house project done. I could put a down payment on a house probably for $10,000. I just started cycling through all of these things. And I didn't say this, which I'm grateful for, but in my mind was thinking, like, that might have been a waste of money. I mean, how much did you pay for the pet? Like, how much longer is it going to live? Like, is that how we want to spend money? $10,000 for a pet? Now, I don't know about you, but like, I, I love productivity and efficiency. Like, I love maximizing my day. I love maximizing my time. I, I think continual about like, how can I get the most out of my day? How can I get the most out of this experience? Uh, I, I do it with lots of things, specifically time, because I think to myself, hey, if I prep coffee in the evening, when I walk down, all I have to do is hit a button, and then I can start doing other things around the kitchen in the morning while the coffee's already going. Anybody else do that? Just a simple life hack, right? To maximize your time. Also love maximizing space. Also in the kitchen, when my kids are loading the dishwasher, like I constantly reorganize and reload the dishwasher to maximize the space 
in the dishwasher so we can get more dishes in and I don't have to wash them by hand. Like love thinking about how we maximize our resources. Like when we go to the grocery store and we're buying Doritos, it's like do we buy name brand Doritos or off brand Doritos? We buy off brand Doritos because they're the same thing and they cost less and we can maximize our resources. And so when somebody's pending $10,000 on a pet surgery, I think to myself, oof, is that the best use of our resources, right? And I wonder if anybody else has had a similar experience where you learn and hear what somebody paid for a certain thing, and you think to yourself, you spent that much on that thing? That seems kind of ludicrous and outrageous. There's this passage in 2 Peter 1 where Peter writes to these group of churches, he says, make every effort. He's trying to encourage the recipients of this letter to maximize your life, essentially. Like, make every effort. Be intentional with the way that you're living. Live in such a way that you can be a good steward of your life. And then he goes on to say, and you do that by adding to your faith all of these things. He says, add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and mutual affection and love. He's saying, do all these things. And there's reason to it. Like there's a purpose to it. He says, make every effort to live in this way. Then he says this in verse 8, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Essentially, Peter is saying, don't waste your life. Don't waste the things that you have. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your abilities. Don't waste your skills and talents. Use them for the sake of the Lord and His kingdom to build His kingdom. And it also says in the Scriptures that that we own nothing, that, that God is the owner of all things. We are just simply stewards of what God has entrusted to us. So therefore, don't waste your life. Don't waste your resources. Do what you can to invest them well to help build God's kingdom. And so with that, I, I value productivity and efficiency and good stewardship. And I'm sure many of us here the same. But what's interesting is when you really dig into God's economy and God's kingdom and how God thinks of the world, you start to bump up against passages of scripture and stories where that idea seems to be challenged. Meaning like the story that we're going to look at this morning raises the question, does God really value productivity and efficiency in the same way that I do? Or does he in turn think differently about certain extravagant expenses or moments or gestures? And then how do we think of our own life in light of that? This is how our passage begins. This is John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. We read, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. So the previous chapter ends with Jesus performing his most amazing miracle of all the miracles that he has performed in the Gospel of John. If you're tracking his miracles, it started in chapter 2 with turning water into wine. And from there, Jesus healed an official son. Just by thinking about this son, the official pleads and begs for Jesus to heal his son, who's a few towns over, and Jesus just says, go home. He's healed. He he doesn't speak the healing. He doesn't do any sort of like dramatic gesture. He just says, go home. Your son is well. From there, he heals a paralytic who's sitting poolside, who's never used his legs, and he gets up for the first time and walks away from the pool. From there, he feeds over 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. Right after that, he walks on water through a storm to the disciples who are in the middle of a boat trying to get from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other. And then in chapter 9, he heals a guy who's been born blind by spitting on the ground, making some mud, wiping it on this guy's eyes, and telling him to go wash out the mud. And then immediately he can see. 
All of Jesus' miracles up to this point have been mind-bending in their own right. But then you come to chapter 11, and he takes this guy who has been dead for four days, whose body has been prepared for burial, probably anointed with oil, wrapped with spices. He's got grave clothes on him. He's in a tomb that's been sealed for four days. And then Jesus shows up, rolls the stone away, and by just simply saying three words, Lazarus, come out, he brings the guy back from the dead. And so then chapter 12 opens with a dinner party that's being thrown for Jesus in his honor, presumably because of what he's done for Lazarus and his family. Because we read in verse 2, Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining with him at the table. The guy who Jesus raised from the dead, sitting right next to him, seemingly healthy, his body functioning perfectly, consuming food, enjoying the moment. And Martha, Lazarus' sister, is there serving at the dinner. And then we'll learn in just a minute that his other sister, Mary, is also at the dinner. So the three people who are the focal point of chapter 11, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, are also the focal point of the beginning of chapter 12 at this dinner party that they're throwing for Jesus based on what he has done for them in their family. And this is a perfectly reasonable response. If I had a family member who passed away and somebody brought them back from the dead, I would throw a rager of a party. I would invite everybody I know. I would give them a plus one. Bring your friends because we're going to have a good old-fashioned throwdown because this dead family member is now back to life. Like an amazing moment. But this story isn't so much about the dinner party and what happened leading up to the dinner party. Rather, it's a story about what happened during the dinner party. And this is what we read in verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. So Jesus is being honored at this dinner party, and Mary, filled with gratitude and joy and delight for what Jesus has done for their family, and she wants to express it and demonstrate it and decides to anoint Jesus with perfume. Now, we don't see too much anointing these days in like most contemporary evangelical churches, but if you've ever seen somebody anoint another person with, say, oil, they usually have a small vial that they can hold in their pocket. They take it out, they take the top off, and they kind of clasp it between their thumb and their forefinger. And they'll maybe rock it back and forth to get a little oil on their finger, and they might just rub it across their forehead or make the sign of a cross to like indicate like we're asking for a special provision or we're just trying to acknowledge that God has done something unique in your life. So every once in a while, you might see an anointing of oil like that. That would have been pretty reasonable for Mary to do. It also would have been reasonable for her to like sprinkle some on Jesus, maybe get a little bit more than just a touch of it and sprinkle it on Jesus. But instead, what she does is it says she pours the perfume. She pours the perfume on Jesus' feet. We see the same episode happen in Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel. And it says that she pours the perfume not only on his feet, but also on his head. She is covering him from head to toe with this perfume. In Mark's account of this story, it says she breaks the bottle. She breaks the bottle that the perfume is carried in, kind of signifying, I'm using it all. I'm holding nothing back. I'm giving all of this to Jesus. And it says that the fragrance fills the house. So in, in our house, we are raising um, young girls who are on the verge of being teenagers. There already are teenagers and then more becoming teenagers. And the smells that are happening in our house these days are all sorts of different things. You have any one of our daughters walk by you, and because of the, the body spray, the perfume, the lotion, the room spray, they walk by you, and you'll get a big whiff of Costa Rican pink pineapple sunbreeze, right? Or you'll get Thailand sweet kiwi starfruit mist, just whoosh, wash by you. Now, fortunately, many of these smells are good. They smell good, but you get this big whiff 
And then it just kind of like lingers there for a moment and then dissipates. But what we're told here is that this fragrance fills not just a room, but this fragrance fills the whole house. This is a highly sensory moment where if you were there, it would be like overwhelming this smell. And this smell, this sensory moment, is also subtly making a contrast to what just happened in chapter 11. Because when Jesus shows up to the tomb of Lazarus, and he's ready to bring him back from the dead, and he rolls the stone away, Martha is there and she's telling Jesus to, you know, wait. She's hesitant to have him do this because what she says is there's a foul odor. The odor of death is in that tomb. And if you open that tomb, the odor of death is going to come out and we're all going to smell it. But what came out of that tomb wasn't the odor of death, but it was brand new life. Lazarus coming back from the dead. And so here you have this sweet fragrance filling the house. And what it captures is that with Jesus, when death presumably is in the air, the fragrance of life has the ability to overtake it. Way stronger than spraying Febreze in your home to get some nasty smell out of the air. The fragrance of life with Jesus is filling the house. And what you see in this moment is that the extravagance of Mary's action captures the extent of her devotion. The extravagance of Mary's action captures the extent of her devotion. She's broken the bottle. She's poured it all out. She's saying, I'm all in on Jesus. There is no one greater than him. I am fully giving my life to him. And what you see in Mary's action is her devotion. And there's three things we learn about devotion from this moment. And the first is that her devotion to Jesus is actually dangerous. Meaning her devotion to Jesus makes her vulnerable. Now, in Jesus' day, in the first century, Jewish dinner parties sometimes were public affairs. Meaning if people were walking by, they might hear some sort of debate going on. People sometimes lined um, the, the out sort of a courtyard where a dinner party was happening to listen in because it was one form of entertainment to listen to debates that took place at dinner parties between you know, maybe highly educated religious leaders. Now, we don't know if that's what's happening here, if this dinner party is a public party, but we do know that the miracle that Jesus performed was very public. Like, people, heard, people saw it. It said that word spread about it. People knew what was going on. It was quite a stir. Not that often dead people get raised to life, so certainly people are going to be talking about it in the town. And where word eventually got back to was the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And we're told at the end of chapter 11, verse 53, that the religious leaders heard about Lazarus' resurrection, and it says that from that point on, they plotted to kill Jesus. And Jesus knew this. In verse 54 of chapter 11, we're told that Jesus withdraws with his disciples, didn't walk around publicly in Judea or Jerusalem anymore because he knew the religious leaders were out to get him, to put a hit on him, and so he was withdrawing. So the fact that Jesus is back in Bethany, which is really close to Jerusalem, is risky, and the fact that other people are demonstrating their allegiance to Jesus is also risky because we jump to the end of this passage verse 9, and we read this. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Verse 10. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. Hey, we're already going to execute that guy, and this guy's associated with that guy, and people are drawn to that guy because of this guy. Let's just kill him too. So the question then is raised, well, if Mary is all in on Jesus, and Jesus and her brother is on the hit list, is she also going to be next? Her devotion to Jesus makes her vulnerable in this moment. Now, I'm going to guess many of us aren't going out in the community in fear of our lives because of our devotion to Jesus 
or we're following Jesus. Some people speculate maybe there will come a time in this country when we have to be mindful of what our safety is if we're associated with Jesus. But for the most part, most of us probably don't go to the grocery store thinking like, is somebody going to get out and get me on this day? But devotion still always makes you vulnerable because devotion creates dependence. When you're devoted to something or someone, you're looking to that thing or that person in some way to help support your own well-being. You're intertwining your life with theirs, and you're creating some measure of dependency on that person. And when you open your life to that person or that thing, dependence makes you vulnerable to disappointment. Like, maybe their commitment won't match yours. Maybe there are circumstances that cause that person, that thing, to be removed from your life rather than enhance your life. It opens you up and creates a moment where you could be disappointed. Uh, last week, our family was in New Hampshire. I was speaking at a camp out that way, a camp I grew up going to, and we were getting ready for a chapel service one morning, and there was a guy in the back who was doing like the, the audio-visual stuff, and he had a New York Giants or New York Jets hat on. And so we were talking about the Jets, and he found out I was from Wisconsin, so we're talking about the Packers and how Aaron Rodgers went from the Packers to the Jets, and he told me, man, when, when they traded Rodgers, like, I was over the moon excited. The Jets are terrible and have been terrible. And he's like, this was going to be our year. All of New York was elated to get Aaron Rodgers. And then what happens? First game of last season, four plays in. He goes down with an Achilles tear and is out for the rest of the season. And it was like, if you, if you follow sports and follow the NFL, it was like all of New York was despondent and depressed because Aaron Rodgers went down. Like they had given their devotion to this team. They had created some measure of attachment to this team. They were committed and they had this moment of like, oh, this is going to be so exciting. And then boom, disappointment hits. So when you're devoted to something, it creates vulnerability because you could find that you're disappointed. Now with Jesus, sometimes that disappointment comes because we place expectations on Jesus that Jesus never promises to fulfill. And so we have to be measured on why are we going to Jesus? What is it that we hope we will get from Jesus? And what we see in this moment with Mary is not only does um, devotion make her vulnerable, but devotion is also relational. Meaning the primary reason we go to Jesus isn't so we can get something from him, whether it's a family member back from the dead, or just a better life, or this job I've always wanted, or peace and contentment and tranquility. Maybe some of these things come your way, but the primary reason we go to Jesus is for relationship with him because we were created to be in relationship with him. And the way we experience the fullness of life is through relationship with Jesus. And what we see in this moment is that Mary's relationship with Jesus is wildly intimate. This is an incredibly intimate moment. Mary is pouring this perfume all over Jesus' body, and she's down by his feet. Now, there's a really good chance his, his feet are clean, I meaning he probably washed them as he came into the house. That was a custom, a common practice in their day. But still, like, if somebody were to, like, n nuzzle up to your feet, like, or if you were to, like, nuzzle up to somebody else's feet, like, that would be a little weird and a little awkward, right? Because feet are kind of like the, we cover them up, like, they kind of look gross. If you don't clean them all too often, you got like lint in between your toes, right? And so Mary's there in this intimate moment. Now, she's been by Jesus' feet before, Luke 10. She was sitting at his feet to learn. But this is a very different posture that she's taking. She's adorning him. She's honoring him. And then she pulls down her hair, which is kind of a, a, a scandalous practice for women in the first century. But she's doing it with the specific purpose of wiping the perfume up from his feet with her hair, which means he's, she's putting her face right by Jesus' feet. And what you see is that Mary is giving all of herself to Jesus. Like she, she knows that she is pushing the social boundaries of what's appropriate for women in that time, but she doesn't care. She, she's running the risk of looking foolish She's running the risk of looking ridiculous and doesn't at all care because she is all in 
on Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but often I want my devotion to Jesus to appear reasonable. Meaning like, hey, I've thought this through. Like, this isn't some like cuckoo sort of religious belief. This is grounded in history. It's grounded in reality. There's veracity in terms of Jesus was a true historical figure. The things that he did actually happened. Like, I want my faith and my devotion to Jesus to appear reasonable, like it's actually well thought through. I also want it to appear inspirational, meaning, hey, there is hope in Jesus, the strongest hope that you could ever have. And if you give your life to him, it too can be an inspiration and a hope for you. Those are things that, that, that I, um, that's a way that I want my faith to appear to other people. But Mary isn't concerned with those things in this moment. She doesn't care if people think she looks ridiculous. She doesn't care if people think she looks foolish. Because she's saying, I'm all in on Jesus. Not just because of what he has done for our family, but because of who he is. He's the true king of kings. He's the true Lord of lords. He's the one who threw the stars in the sky and holds the moon up by his powerful word. He holds all things together. He is the one our hearts long for. And she's adorning him just for who he is. And so you find that her devotion is vulnerable, her devotion is relational, and it's also sacrificial. Because then we see this. After she pours out all this perfume, we start to then see the reaction of the disciples and the other individuals who are in the room in this moment. And what we read is this in verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. I mean, let that sink in, right? What kind of bottle of perfume does anybody have that is worth a whole year's wages. It, thought, it was thought that this perfume, they say it's pure nard, came from India. And so the extensive um, travel that it would have taken to bring that to Jerusalem made the cost go up. How it was made was really cons- time consuming, also makes the cost grow up. Why Mary has this expensive perfume, we're not told, but it could be sold and could provide for her family for a year. Now, Judas here is trying to look noble. Oh, we could give this money to the poor, right? But then we read in verse 6 that he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief as a keeper of the money bag, and he used it to help himself to what was put in it. So meaning Judas is looking at this moment, and he's looking at this gift, and he's thinking about it in terms of himself like how he could have taken advantage, how he could have benefited. And sometimes we think, yeah, that's Judas just being Judas. But when we look at Mark's account of this story and we look at Matthew's account of this story, we see that Judas isn't the only one who thinks this. But we're told in both Mark and Matthew's account of this story that the rest of the disciples kind of had a similar idea and a similar perception And it says in Matthew 26 that the disciples were indignant and actually vocalized, why this waste? They're they're perceiving Mary's devotion as a waste, a waste of resources, a waste of what could have been done, a waste of how they could have either benefited themselves or helped other people because this perfume was worth a whole year's income. That's incredible. And I think sometimes when we look at the way that other people make decisions about life, whether they spend $10,000 on a dog surgery or they invest money here or are generous over there, it can cause similar reactions in ourselves where we think, like, why are we wasting all this stuff? But what we see is that here Mary's Devotion is on full display. The extravagance of Mary's action captures the extent of her devotion. And who we want to be as a church is create people, like our mission statement says, who are fully devoted. Our mission statement reads, Meadowbrook Church exists to invite people to discover Jesus and become his fully devoted follower who will influence the world. 
We desire for people to be fully devoted to who Jesus is, the way that He has ordered the world and the way He's calling us to live in that world. And so one of the ways you discern, am I truly devoted to Jesus, is how you perceive moments when somebody is apparently wasteful with their resources. And then you begin to evaluate them based on your own judgment of that. Now, for many of us, maybe it is money. Maybe it is resources. We look at the way that people or organizations spend their money, and we think like, oh, how could they ever? But also for many of us, it's time. Time and money, right, are the two main indicators that communicate what you're devoted to and how you perceive what's really important to you. And for me, I am most challenged by the idea of wasting time when it comes to, am I truly devoted to Jesus, or am I just out for things for myself? Because when it comes to being a pastor, when it comes to doing the work that I have to do, one of the biggest challenges for me is managing my time. And the thing that challenges my time, the thing that challenges my productivity the most is all of you, right? Because you call me, and you email me, and you text me, and you show up to the church unannounced, and you want to sit in my office and chat, right? All of which is fine. Keep emailing me, keep calling me, keep texting me, keep showing up. But when I'm focused on myself, and when I'm focused on my schedule, and when I'm focused on the things that I have to do, typically the motivation for my productivity is to look good. It's to stand up in front of people and be like, look what I accomplished. To look impressive. To stand up and be able to preach a sermon that's, that's eloquent and I don't fumble through my words because I've put in the time to make it what it is. And so constantly in the life of a pastor, interruptions are there all the time. Uh, I used to um, work alongside this guy in Atlanta when we served in Atlanta. His name was Jeff. And Jeff and I decided to pray every day when we were in the office together. Every day, we'd start our day in prayer. And uh, my prayers were about 60 to 90 seconds. Efficient with my prayer, said the thing that I wanted to say, let's move on. Jeff's prayers sometimes could be 30 minutes long. And he would just go on and on, and he would read Bible passages, and he would pray for anybody and everybody under the sun. And I used to sit in prayer meetings with Jeff and just think like, Jeff, oh. Lord, please help Jeff. Uh, please help Jeff to be concise with his words. And at times, think to myself, this is such a colossal waste of time, right? Like, my job is to be with people. My job is to shepherd people. My job is to pray with people and pray for people, to be devoted to prayer. And sometimes these things that are my job appear to me as a waste of time because they're not moving things forward. Now, I don't actually think prayer is a waste of time. But when I'm focused on myself, it can get perceived that way. And God's trying to reorder my expectation of what's really important. How does God's economy work? He's not focused on productivity like I am. He's not focused on efficiency like I am. Hey, even just this week, we had a guy who called our church. He was in need of help, doesn't go to our church. He's probably calling every church just looking for help. Nate called him back. It was like 12.30 when Nate called him back. He came in from lunch, and he's like, hey, did you guys respond to this? We were like, nope. And he's like, I'm going to go do it. Eventually, he got the guy to come here so we could sit down and see how we could help him. Nate spent probably like two and a half hours with this guy, from like 1.30 to almost 3, and he was trying to leave at 3.30 and had all these other things that he needed to get done. And I'm in the lobby with Chris having a meeting. Nate's over here connecting with this guy, and I keep looking, and I keep checking, and like, are they almost done? Because if I'm Nate, I would be losing my mind. I would have showed this guy the door an hour and a half ago, but he was patient, and he came out of that saying, like, I just wanted to help him like Jesus would. I just want to help him um, as if that were Jesus in the flesh, and all I could think about was, like, productivity, productivity, efficiency, getting things done, got to make things happen, and Jesus is constantly reminding me, like, yeah, your productivity doesn't matter like maybe you think it does. Your, your efficiency doesn't matter like you think it does. It, it's okay at times to be wasteful, to honor God, and to love people well. 
And that's what we see in this moment with Mary. And so the question for us is, are we devoted, as devoted to Jesus as we think we are? Or do these moments where money controls us or time controls us, because what we really want is control more than anything else, like, do those moments really highlight what we're devoted to? Because if it's money, maybe it's security. Maybe you're really devoted to your security because you perceive that if I have enough money here, then I'll be okay. Or maybe you're really devoted to your identity and how people perceive you because you want to look a certain way when Jesus is saying, those things don't matter as much as a relationship with me. And so this passage stands as a challenge. It stands as a challenge to identify where our true devotion lies. It stands as an invitation to trust Jesus more than anything else. And it stands as a question as what do you need to give to Jesus? Because this passage finishes this way, verse 7. After all of the disciples, especially Judas, are like overwhelmed with how much she's wasting on Jesus, he says, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Jesus basically welcomes our waste. Meaning, Jesus welcomes extravagant amount of time spent with him, extravagant amount of generosity towards him simply because he's worthy. He's worthy of our time. He's worthy of our resources. Because what we see in the Gospels is Jesus desires devotion of us, but he also gives that same devotion to us meaning he is more devoted to us than we could ever imagine because in his devotion, he makes himself vulnerable by going to the cross, paying the price for our sin and death, ultimately to bring us back in relationship to him. Jesus is motivated by the possibility and the potential of relationship with us to be with him at all costs. And he's willing to sacrifice it all. He's willing to sacrifice his life. He's willing to sacrifice his well-being just for the chance of being in relationship with us. And Jesus is worthy of a response of giving our whole life to him. Because basically, the reality is that money that we might perceive as a waste by being generous to the kingdom pales in comparison to the price Jesus paid for us. The identity that we work so hard to maintain is not nearly as secure as the identity as being a son and daughter of the king of the universe. Because if your performance tanks, your identity tanks. But you will always be a child of God when you give your whole life for him, to him. And what we see in this moment is that this moment is a pointer to when Jesus will give his life for the world. He said, like, she was to reserve this perfume for my burial, which who knows if she realizes that, the disciples don't realize it, realize it, but his burial, his death and burial are days away at this moment in the Gospel of John, highlighting that Jesus is giving to us way more than we could ever give to him. And so the way that we're going to respond to this message is by going before the Lord's table. As a way to remind ourselves of how much God has given for us and ask the question, what is he asking of me to give to him? What he's asking is everything. He's asking of your whole life. It doesn't mean he's asking, actually asking you to sell your house and give all your money away. But he's asking you to understand that all of your life is his. All of what you own belongs to him. And are you willing to hold it open-handed to say, Lord, use it all. Take it all. Even if to the world it appears wasteful. Because what we receive in return is far greater than anything we could ever experience in the here and now. So why not bet the farm on Jesus? 
Why not cash in all your chips and say, this is all for him?